tax overhaul for Iowans could open up broad discussion over income tax rates and credits, and divisive issues like water quality could come under increased scrutiny here in Des Moines. Please escort the Chief Justice and the Justices of the Supreme Court and the Chief Judge and Judges of the Court of Appeals to their seats. We're still bringing the uh, Justices of the Iowa Supreme Court in. It's quite a ceremony that goes into bringing the members of the Senate you know, into the chamber, bringing the, the Justices of the Supreme Court, bringing state elected officials uh, into the chamber. These are rituals that have been observed for as long as I can remember, and it's a, a great tradition here. We're in this historic chamber here at the Iowa Capitol. It never looks better. Uh, it's been renovated. Uh, the Capitol is uh, always spruced up for an event like a governor's condition of the state speech. The chair recognizes the sergeant at arms. Please escort Lieutenant Governor the, Gregg the Lieutenant and his Governor family to their seats. Acting Lieutenant Governor Adam Gregg <laughs> and his family are being seated. There's a little controversy over uh, Adam Gregg's status. He, uh, the governor's office calls him the Lieutenant Governor. Technically, he's the acting Lieutenant Governor. Uh, if something untoward should happen to Governor Reynolds, um, her successor is uh, the President of the Senate, not uh, Adam Gregg. This is a little bit of a glitch in the Constitution. There's been some controversy over this. I would expect at some point we may see this legislature try to clarify uh, these succession issues. The chair recognizes the sergeant at arms. Mr. President, first gentleman, Kevin Reynolds, daughter Jen, Jason, and Avery Fagan, daughter Nicole Springer, brother Doug Strong, and Charles and Strong have arrived in the House chamber. Please escort Governor Reynolds' family to their seats. Family is entering the chamber, Governor's husband. Iowa's first, first gentleman. And his children, Governor's children, relatives. I remember when she uh, first took office, she said her grandkids were going to have a great time in uh, playing around that Terrace Hill Governor's Mansion. I imagine that's true made for kids. <laughs> Governor's waiting in the wings. They're running a little behind uh, schedule. The joint convention will be in order. The chair recognizes the sergeant at arms. The committee will escort the Honorable Kim Reynolds to the rostrum. Governor Reynolds coming to, into the House chamber. This is her first condition of the state speech as governor. Very positive, upbeat mood she hopes to strike today. Something of a re-election speech as well. We'll be hearing more from Governor Reynolds momentarily. Getting a good reception from legislators. This is always a civil time. Governor takes a deep breath. I imagine it is a little nervous being the first time you give a condition of a state speech. I know it would be for me. The chamber is always quite civil during this early days. It is my distinct honor to introduce our 43rd governor, Governor Kim Reynolds, to deliver her first condition of the state message to the 2018 session of the 87th General Assembly. Governor Reynolds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Mr. Lieutenant Governor, Mr. President, Madam Speaker, legislative leaders, senators and representatives, justices and judges, elected official, officials, distinguished guests, family, friends, and my fellow Iowans. It's an honor to be here today as your 43rd governor and to deliver my first condition of the state address. Wow, what a country and state that we live in, where a small town girl from rural Iowa can become governor and have the opportunity to serve Iowans at the highest level. And I hope that that can be an inspiration to every waitress, every grocery checker, every overworked and stressed out mom, and little girls who dare to dream. Because in Iowa, if you're willing to work for it, those dreams can come true. I want to begin this morning by taking a moment to recognize the heroes among us, the brave men and women who have given so much of their time, energy, and talent on our behalf. To our men and women serving in the military, law enforcement, and as first responders, on behalf of Iowans, we extend our deepest gratitude for your sacrifice and service. I also want to recognize with shared sadness those who aren't with us this year. Representative Greg Forrestal, Representative Kirk Hansen, former Senate Majority Leader Cal Holtman, former Speaker of the House Don Avison, and former Lieutenant Governor Joy Corning. Dedicated public servants and effective leaders who cared about their constituents and made a difference for the people of Iowa. Today, I am proud to report to the people of Iowa and their representatives that because our ability to dream is infinite and the will of our people is great, the condition of our state is strong. <laughs> Iowa is ranked as the third best managed state in America and the number one state for middle class families. Our graduation rate is higher, highest in the nation, while unemployment is one of the lowest. These successes are not by accident. Thanks to the strong leadership of this legislature, last year was the most pro-jobs, pro-growth legislative session in decades. But mostly, the success of our state has come from our people, hardworking and disciplined, innovative and driven. The condition of our state is strong because Iowans are discovering and unleashing opportunities in our schools, on our factory floors, on main streets, and around kitchen tables. In 2017, I was so proud to work with this legislature to move our state forward. So let me take just a moment to highlight what we accomplished together. We balanced the state budget, protecting taxpayers while safeguarding important priorities like education. We invested in our kids at a record level, committing $735 million for education since 2011. We prepared our students for the jobs of tomorrow through work-based learning, pre-apprenticeship, and computer science programs. 
We reformed collective bargaining and workers' compensation laws, putting more power in the hands of local governments, school districts, small businesses, and taxpayers. We protected the ballot box with new voter ID laws. We protected life, standing up for the most vulnerable by protecting late-term abortions, and we will never stop fighting to protect the unborn. We restored liberties by strengthening our Second Amendment rights and defended taxpayers against costly project labor agreements. We fought for Iowa farmers and a robust renewable fuel, fuel standard, and we won. And I'm proud to report that the Iowa Energy Plan is delivering action by continuing to lead the nation in innovative energy ideas. But there's still unfinished business. Improving water quality is a shared goal of Iowans. Urban and rural stakeholders have worked collaboratively, making great strides. My hope is that a water quality bill is the first piece of legislation that I have an opportunity to sign as governor. But let me assure you, passage of this monumental legislation does not mean that the water quality discussion is over. Rather, it ignites the conversation to implement and scale practices that will continue to make an impact on water quality. As we look back to 2017, it's clear that we have much to be proud of, but now is the time to look forward. My vision for the future is an Iowa overflowing with opportunity, opportunity for our working families, our young people, and our communities, both rural and urban, a place where it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, young or old, male or female, where your last name or zip code aren't nearly as important as your ability to dream and your willingness to reach for it. A place where if life got in the way of those dreams, you can find a second start. And if you've made mistakes, you can find a second chance. Because opportunity means everyone has a chance to succeed. It doesn't mean government picking winners and losers or waiting for government to fix every problem. It means, it means, when we face challenges, we do what Iowans have always done, and that's roll up our sleeves and get to work. While there are many issues to discuss today, I want to pause for a moment and talk about something that has captured the attention of the entire nation. Throughout history, sexual harassment has been a stain on our culture, a destructive force in politics media, entertainment, in workplaces, large and small, and in all facets of life. And it must stop. I commend... I commend the number of women who have found the courage to speak out. As a woman, a mother of three girls, a grandmother, wife, sister, and daughter, I understand that we're at an unprecedented, unprecedented moment in time. I also understand that this is not a partisan issue. It can't be fixed by legislation or rulemaking alone. You can't legislate kindness or respect or morality. They must be taught. 
And that means the solution starts with every individual, man or woman. It's about showing respect to others. It's about character and decency. And it's about changing the culture once and for all. All of us in public office must ensure not only a safe workplace, but serve as a model for the public and private sector. <laughs> what we do matters. Iowans are watching. We can't change behavior everywhere, but we have an obligation to lead. And as long as I'm governor, we're going to. <laughs> Iowans are good people, they're humble people, and no matter our differences on policy and politics, we must always strive to reflect the goodness of those we represent. It's the people of Iowa who make this job what it is. And I love waking up every day with the opportunity to make a difference. And while I love our capital city and everything it offers, I believe that the heart, soul, and spirit of Iowa will always remain in our small towns and rural communities. From Decorah to Manning, Lamars to Mount Pleasant, and everywhere in between, we are defined as Iowans who dream big in these small places. Like many of you, I grew up in one of those small towns. And when I go home, I hear the disappointment and I share the frustration when another store closes. I appreciate the hard work taking place by our community leaders to keep our main streets alive and vibrant. Our downtowns are the backdrop for memories and the foundation for, the future, for future success stories. Their buildings, businesses, and people have character and are the hubs for economic growth. Our work ethic is our currency and people all over Iowa are ready to invest this valuable resource in their communities. So today, I'm announcing a new initiative that focuses on rural Iowa, which I have asked Lieutenant Governor Gregg to lead. We'll bring together leaders from across Iowa with different backgrounds to be a part of this important effort. Iowans who have lived in rural communities all their lives, those who recently moved there, young professionals, successful business owners, and those just starting out. This new initiative will promote investment and connect rural Iowa by expanding broadband capabilities in every single corner of our state. Our goal, to keep and bring home Iowa's sons and daughters and grow the next generation of community leaders. Last month, Congress passed historic tax reform, legislation that gives significant tax cuts to working class Iowans and gives even greater relief for families who are raising children. Across the board, in virtually every income bracket, Iowans will see relief. And for that, I want to thank Congress and the President. Because every day I meet Iowans who tell me that no matter how hard they work, they're still treading water and struggling to make ends meet. But here's the thing. Because of an outdated provision in Iowa's tax code, Iowans will see a tax increase if we don't pass tax reform at the state level. Iowa is one of only three states that allow taxpayers to deduct their federal taxes. And while that might sound like a good thing, right now it's not. It creates complexity, and worse, it means 
that when your federal taxes go down, your Iowa taxes go up. And it often punishes those who we want to help the most. With federal deductibility in place, when the federal government cuts taxes for working class families, Iowa raises taxes on those same families. When the federal government cuts taxes for farmers and small businesses, Iowa raises taxes on farmers and small businesses. And that's not just a hypothetical. It's what will happen if we don't act. Therefore, I'll be proposing a tax reform package that significantly reduces rates, modernizes our tax code, eliminates federal deductibility, and provides real tax relief for middle-class families, farmers, and small businesses. This is an opportunity to free us from decisions made in Washington, D.C. and simplify our tax code. And more importantly, Iowans will keep more of their hard-earned money. Like many of you, Kevin and I lived on a tight budget while raising our girls. We had to focus on priorities, making tough decisions on what we could and couldn't afford. It's no secret while working through some tough times with our state budget. So we have to focus on what we can afford. While I want to reduce our uncompetitive corporate taxes, this is not the year. In the meantime, I'll be creating a bipartisan task force to analyze every tax credit and come back with recommendations prior to the next legislative session. That will provide the opportunity to address our corporate tax rate with a better understanding of the larger picture. It may take a multi-year effort, but we're going to completely reform our tax code. We're going to make it more, we're going to make Iowa more competitive and we're going to continue to be a place where businesses, big and small, want to grow and expand in Iowa. Nearly everything that's important to our future, our schools, jobs, energy, growth, depends on the health of our people. If Iowans aren't healthy, they can't learn, they can't work, they, they can't take care of their families, and they can't succeed. Before the Affordable Care Act, Iowa had an individual insurance market with relatively low, low cost and high participation. Today, our healthcare market is collapsing. It's unaffordable, it's unsustainable, and it's unacceptable. While I continue to call on Congress to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, we can't wait for Congress to fix it. This session, we must work together to pass legislation that gives Iowa farmers, small business owners, and their workers access to affordable insurance.
to meet the needs of our most vulnerable Iowans, to ensure we have affordable health care coverage for working families, to provide compassionate mental health care, and to fight the plague of opioid addiction. We must address these complex issues in a coordinated and strategic approach that builds on the progress we've made together. Almost two years ago, we modernized our Medicaid system to an individualized, patient-centered approach that was already in place in 39 other states, a change that needed to be made. Under the old system, cost soared, fraud had occurred, it was unsustainable, and we weren't focused on patient outcomes. I still believe managed care is the right decision for Iowa, but it has become very clear that were, mistakes were made in how it was done. Shortly after being sworn in as governor, I took deliberate action to make a change. I hired a new director for the Department of Human Services who has the passion and most importantly, the compassion to make this work. And he has hired a new Medicaid director with the experience to get things turned around. With this new team in place, we are working with our care caregivers to resolve issues in a timely manner and ensure on-time payments. We're continuing to work with our managed care organizations to ensure Iowans are getting the best possible outcomes. And we're reaching patients in new and innovative, innovative ways to individualize their care. This is something that I think about and work on every day because it is so important to so many Iowans. And my promise to you is we will make this right. We must continue our efforts to provide compassionate mental health care. In 2013, we redesigned Iowa's mental health system with bipartisan input and support. We moved from a county-by-county -county system to a regional network, ensuring the same core services for all Iowans, no matter where they lived. 150,000 more Iowans have mental health coverage today and have access to more local and modern service. We've invested $2 billion in mental health services, and in 2016, we invested $4 million in a new psychiatric medical residency program to recruit and retain more psychiatrists. But we must do more, and I know we can. That's why I look forward to partnering with Des Moines University and the National Alliance on Mental Health Illness on their exciting new initiative where every doctor will receive the training and skills to identify and treat a patient with a mental health challenge. As a partner, I've included in my budget money for this innovative pilot program, a first of its kind, and since Des Moines University trains more primary care physicians than any other medical school in the country, it's a significant step forward. We have students and faculty from Des Moines University with us today. Please join me in thanking them for the leadership they've shown in mental health education and awareness.
To improve our mental health system, we can't just focus on the sheer number of beds. We must identify the gaps in our system. In many cases, Iowans suffering from mental illness don't need hospitalization, but they also can't get the care they need at home. They need a safe place to stay that offers professional services and a watchful eye. We need to establish residential access centers that will provide short-term care for those in crisis. A place with the resources necessary to get these Iowans stabilized and back home to their families. To help make this happen, I'm asking the legislature to remove the cap on subacute beds. And I'm asking the mental health regions and our stakeholders to work with me to create a long-term and sustainable funding structure to establish these much-needed crisis access centers. Creating a mental health system is complex, and it won't be solved overnight. But no parent, child, friend, or neighbor should suffer in silence when it comes to mental health. Addiction can be just as anguishing for families, and many of you know someone who has suffered from the wave of heroin and opioid addiction that is making its way through Iowa. This is an issue that is very personal to me, to the thousands of Iowans impacted by addiction. I've been there. I understand your struggles. My family understands your struggles. And I know that life can be so much better, like it is for Caleb, a recovering opioid addict from Dubuque. His life was saved after an overdose that nearly left him dead. Through the help of medicated assistant, assisted treatment and a recovery program, he's turned his life around. Caleb's kept a job for over a year. He's re received promotions and raises and is happier than he's ever been. While courageously sharing his story at our recent, at our recent opioid summit, Caleb said, even though I'm a high school dropout, I feel like I'm very wealthy. Caleb, we're all richer for hearing your story. In the past decade, opioid-related deaths have more than doubled and will continue to rise unless we take action to reverse this, this heart-wrenching trend. My plan is to, to address this epidemic includes increasing the use of our prescription monitoring program, enhancing intervention for Iowans addicted to opioids, and expanding medicated assistant treatment, the very program that helped Caleb. And today, I'm calling on the legislature to pass legislation to reduce the number of opioids being prescribed in Iowa. This is a big step in the right direction. It will change lives, and it will provide opportunities for a brighter future. The foundation for a bright future starts early. So when we talk about unleashing opportunity and prioritizing our budget, nothing is more important to me than investing in our children. In today's changing economy, whether our kids are bound for a four-year college, a community college, trade school, military service, or headed into the workforce. We must prepare them for a productive and successful life. That's why we've invested over $37 million in STEM through public-private partnerships. And one school district and community that has embraced STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math education, 
From the very beginning is Harlan Community School District. From pint-sized science to being the first school to participate in the National Guard STEM Day, Harlan School District is a perfect example of how schools, business, and communities are preparing their students for the jobs of tomorrow. We have students with us today. Please join from Harlan with us today. Please stand and let us recognize you and thank them for joining us. Since taking office seven years ago, we've added $735 million in new funding to K-12 education. And at $3.3 billion, funding is at an all-time high. In fact, a recent study by the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities found that over the last 10 years, only three states increased education funding at a higher rate than Iowa. Education is a priority, and we'll continue to back that up with real money. And that's why in my budget, I'm proposing $54 million in new money for our schools. We've also maintained our commitment to school choice, which offers families the option to teach their values, beliefs, and viewpoints to their children. That's why my tax reform plan will expand 529 plans to include K-12 education. But we also can't fall into the trap of measuring the quality of our education system by the sheer number of dollars we put in it. If we're not focused on preparing our young people for the future, then we're failing. The economy is changing. The demand of the workforce is changing. And our education system must change with it. On that front, I am proud to say that Iowa is ahead of the game. Last fall, Mike Rowe, the host of Dirty Jobs, visited Central Campus in Des Moines and called its pre-apprenticeship program a model for high schools all over our country. He talked about how welding, carpentry, nursing, drywall, automotive, how all the major trades were represented. We're fortunate to have students with us from Central Campus. When talking about your school, Mike said that you have a pre-apprenticeship program that rivals the best he's ever seen, that you, the kids in this program, are given real-world experiences, so real that your high school classes are translating into college credits. We can and should emulate your program around our state, and the initiative to help us do that is Future Ready Iowa. Future Ready Iowa will create an environment where opportunity is unleashed, a place where high-paying jobs are seamlessly linked with a motivated and highly skilled workforce. In Iowa, the careers of tomorrow are being created today, with starting salaries of 40, even 50,000 a year, just waiting to be filled. In fact, right now, there are more than 50,000 job openings on the Iowa Workforce Development website, many in high demand, high paying fields. At the same time, we all have friends, relative, relatives, neighbors, ambitious and hardworking, but lacking the skills or self-confidence that they need to reach out and seize one of those careers. But this morning, I'd like to introduce you to one Iowan, Amy Buzel, who chased her dream and earned the career she always wanted. Amy's, Amy's college story began more than 20 years ago when she was a new mother. At the age of 19, she put her dreams on hold so she could put her child first. Later, she attended community college off and on, but it never resulted in a degree. 
but Amy had the courage and initiative to keep trying. In 2016, after two and a half years of study, sleepless nights, and sacrifice, Amy crossed the stage at age 42, receiving her hard-earned diploma from Iowa State University. I know Amy's story because that day, I walked across that stage. We sat next to each other at graduation, ages 42 and 57, a mother of five and a mother of three, aware that just because life got in the way, it didn't mean opportunity had to be forever out of reach. So to every Iowan wanting to do more to make that dream a reality, if Amy and I can do it, so can you. Amy, please stand so we can give you a proper congratulations. Today, just over half our workforce has training or education beyond high school, and we're going to change that. By 2025, our goal is for 70% of Iowa workers to have the skills they need to land a great job. To reach that goal, we'll partner with the private, sec private sector to rapidly expand education and training opportunities for more than 127,000 working men and women. It's a big challenge, but we're going to get there and we're starting now. Today, I'm calling on the legislature to pass the Future Ready Iowa Act. It's a bill that creates opportunity for Iowans of all ages and experiences, opportunities to get the skills that they need for a rewarding career. It starts with the K-12 system, and I want children to know from the earliest age that they have options. I want them to know that trade programs and community colleges can prepare them for high-paying careers. In Manchester, a company called Henderson Products needed skilled workers, welders. So they partnered with West Delaware High School and Northeast Iowa Community College to establish a program that gives students a head start on learning the skilled trade of welding while still in high school. And it delivered Henderson the workforce they needed. Through the success of this partnership, Henderson has hired nearly 30 new welders. And for a town of 5,000 people, that has a real impact. That's why I've included 500,000 in my budget to expand this type of work-based learning. We have students from West Delaware High School here today. Please join me in recognizing them for their outstanding work. I think they're... <laughs> we must do everything we can to steer Iowans, young and old, to training programs that lead to great careers. To do that, we'll create a new scholarship for Iowans who decide to pursue up to a two-year degree in a high-demand field, like nursing, advanced manufacturing, or computer science. These scholarships will pay for the students' remaining tuition and are available to Iowans of any age, whether they just graduated from high school or are looking to change careers. We'll also create a new grant program for people who started a four-year degree but never finished, so people like Amy know it's never too late. So if this is your dream, now is the time to chase it. I also want to increase our support for apprenticeships. apprenticeships. That's why I've included an additional $1 million in my budget to expand Iowa's current apprenticeship program to help more small and mid-sized employers offer these life-changing opportunities. Finally, Working with the private sector will create the Iowa Employer Innovation Fund, 
which will revolutionize the way we think about workforce training. Instead of government deciding which programs are needed, decisions will be made at the local level by businesses and job creators. They'll invest their money in training programs that fit their needs, and the State Innovation Fund will provide matching dollars. Iowa businesses are already stepping up, and I want to thank the Iowa Business Council for leading the way, committing to hire 30,000 interns, externs, and apprentices by 2025. Future Ready Iowa will have a real impact on Iowans. People like George Secor, who is with us today. He became an Iowan at the age of five when his family moved here to escape violence in Liberia. While at Lincoln High School, through the IJAG program, George took advantage of an internship at Principal Financial, which opened the door to a full-time job after graduation. Now George is studying at DMAC while working at Principal, an opportunity that he never thought possible. This is what happens when our young people see at an early age the opportunities available right here in Iowa. It's what happens when our businesses work with our schools. And it's what happens when our young people make the connection between an education and a career. George, please stand so we can acknowledge your outstanding accomplishments. As I said at the start, I believe that Iowa is and ought to be a place where if you're willing to work for it, you can make your dreams come true. My vision is to give the people of Iowa a place to call home that unleashes opportunity at every turn. For all Iowans, for people like Caleb, Amy, and George, let's build a future where our ability to dream is infinite and the will of our people remains eternally unbroken. From the cities and suburbs to our smallest towns and rural communities, together we are greater than the sum of our parts. Together the condition of our state is strong and together we can pass on to our children and Iowa even greater than the one we inherited. May God bless you and continue to bless the great state of Iowa. God bless you. Well, Governor Kim Reynolds has just completed her first condition of the state speech. She's making her way out of the chamber here at the state capitol, the house chamber. Getting some congratulations there from House Speaker Linda Upmeyer. Two firsts right there, two women. The governor gave a, a strong uh, speech uh, where she said the state's condition was strong. I thought one of the more potent and powerful parts of her speech was a strong statement uh, on sexual harassment. Um, well, she went on at some length about Governor the problems. Her family from the House chamber. She went on at some length about the, the problem in our society and giving a strong statement uh, against sexual harassment. Senate Republicans have taken some heat over the way they handled the controversy over that. Governor attempting to limit some of that damage. We're going to be hearing a few moments from 
Senate Minority Leader Janet Peterson to give her thoughts as a, a Democratic leader of what she heard uh, today from, from the governor's speech. There was a real rural focus to the speech, talking about the need to uh, do things to help rural Iowa. Rural Iowa was a big part of the governor's political base. But the fact is that many urban areas of the state are doing pretty well, and rural Iowa has, feels left behind. And so there's going to be some special attention put here on what can be doing, done to jumpstart the rural economy. Governor being greeted by legislators, former colleagues. She served in the state Senate. Making her way out of the chamber. Another specific point that, that the governor mentioned was elimination of a thing called federal deductibility. Iowa's one of three states where you have the ability to deduct your federal taxes from your state income tax bills. The effect of that is when the federal government cuts taxes, as they've just done, that will increase the amount of state taxable income. It's going to mean a several million dollar windfall. And she said the state needs to repeal that. Now, that's quite a change for, for Republicans. I remember for years ago, Governor Branstead tried to do something similar and ran into a wall of opposition from uh, Iowans for tax relief. But what has happened is as Iowa seeks to compete, we find ourselves looking bad in comparison with other states. The legislature adjourning their special session to hear the governor's speech. One of the things the governor uh, decided to punt on was the question of tax credit. There are a lot of questions, a lot of criticisms that Iowa has too many tax credits uh, and it's draining state tax revenues. She, she said she's going to create uh, a system to study that issue until the next uh, election, until, uh, until the next session. We're going to be joined here momentarily by Senator Janet Peterson. We're joined now with Senate Minority Leader Janet Peterson. She's a Democrat from Des Moines, recently installed as Minority Leader. Welcome, Senator. Thank you. Happy thank, to be here. Thank you for being with us. Apologize for the noise in the background. <laughs> give, I'm used to it. <laughs> give us your reaction to, to the speech that you heard. In the I thought the governor did a really nice job with her delivery and being positive about the state of Iowa, saying that we're in a strong state. She does have a cloud looming over her head with the budget that we're facing coming into this session. We know one of the first bills we're going to have to tackle is Republicans are going to have to cut back this year's budget, which is going to be painful for Iowans. They've already cut it to the quick. What's the effect of that budget cut going to be? Well, you know, Iowans across our state are feeling the pains of essential services being um, eliminated. We've lost hearing aid coverage for our kids. We've lost autism services for our kids. They've significantly cut back children's mental health. Uh, nursing home uh, oversight is now being done by phone and in person. And if you know most older Iowans, it's, it's hard to hear over the phone. So we're not getting the true oversight we need in our nursing homes. And we're seeing cuts like that all around the state. What's your, what's your reaction to her call for mental health care programs and changes? Well, I thought her proposal about um, Des Moines University getting a quarter of a million dollars to teach um, our incoming providers about mental health services is great. It's just a really small thing that we can do. The problem is much bigger than that. And I didn't see a lot of substance to how she's going to fund it and um, how we would put that in place quickly. Um, you know, Iowans are calling for these services and we're still seeing continued cuts to children's mental health care and to mental health services across our state. And we have to address that more quickly. Speaking of quickly, we've got time for just one more question. How do you think Democratic lawmakers are going to react uh, to this speech and her program? 
Well, I think Democrats are interested in seeing, you know, is there really proof behind these these uh, programs that she's she's talking about? Future Ready Iowa. We have uh, we have Iowans on the waiting list to get uh, community college assistance um, from our Kibbe program, which we know works. Kids and adults that are part of that program have a twice as likely graduation rate, and we have a waiting list for that. So we don't see new dollars coming in. So we're scared she might be taking money from programs that we know work and help Iowans get good paying jobs. Senator, thank you very much for taking a few moments to be with us. We're yeah, going to look forward to having Thanks. you join us on the Iowa Press Program this weekend. Great. Thank you. We'll be discussing, as I mentioned, the legislative session this Friday on Iowa Press. Senator Peterson joins us along with Speaker of the House Linda Upmeyer. Both leaders will preview the upcoming session from here at our on-site studio at the Iowa State House. That's Iowa Press, Friday night at 7.30 and Sunday at noon. For our entire Iowa Public Television crew here at the State Capitol in Des Moines, I'm David Yepsen, and thanks for joining us today. Funding for this program was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation. Generations of families and friends who feel passionate about the programs they watch on Iowa Public Television.